about what's going on, please go to my website, clintonhouse.org. You can get this book there or call the church and someone will make sure you get it in your hands. Share it with a friend. Good time to share good information and positive things when a lot of negative things are going on in our world. Now, let's get into our lesson, The God of Peace in Philippians, the fourth chapter and verse nine. I'm going to read it from the NIV version. It says, the things which you have, which you have, which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is talking to the Philippian church here as he is moving them down into more of a practical application to what he's talking to us about how to get this God of peace with us. I'm going to drop some things on you tonight. It's not going to be that deep, but roll with me. You're going to get some good information. The power here is the power of purity Paul is talking about, moving from thinking to doing, the power of purity. Having my life one that is pleasing to God moves from just thinking to doing, doing it, thinking to doing it. And you might know it like this, don't talk about it, be about it, or put it to action what God has given you and what's been placed in your heart. He said he leaves this, this he gives him this category, he leaves the category of virtue and nurture nature and, and na nurture nature i'm sorry and moves on into uh, for the world that they were around he had to speak to them in their language so he moves them out of virtue and moves them into practicality because the virtue is spoken about in verse 8 and these things are praiseworthy to god as you think on these things he speaks also to them if you look at the fourth chapter of Philipp philippi and look at the 15th verse he calls them philippians or philippians letting them see that the region, speaking to the consciousness of the region that they were in, the civil consciousness sometimes affects us in this environment that we live in or where we reside. He knew where they were in this Roman colony of this post outside that was that's outside of the Roman um, colony. But here's where they were living. There were Philippians, Philippi, very powerful city, very rich city, one of the major metropolis of that region of Macedonia. Paul wanted them to get this to their spirits. I know where you're at and I'm writing to you in the region that you are in. He says to them again in that fourth chapter in verse nine, he says, whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Paul is the example here. He says, do this, put this to practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is saying that what you have learned in these things, what I've shown you and what you have read about me, he said, this is my character and this is my conversation, is my manner of life. The things that you have learned, received, heard, and seen speaks to my character, my conversation, and manner of life. The conduct of an individual. But Paul says that God has given him grace to maintain virtue or praiseworthiness unto the Lord and it's on display in his life. He's putting himself as a testimony to them and he says it like this in Philippians 3 and verse 17 through 9, 18. He says, brethren and sisters, he says, and just as you have, have, have us as a model, watch that word, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. You can't watch everybody, but there is somebody living this thing and walking it out. He says, for I have often told you before, now I'll tell you even with tears. He's away from them. His heart is aching and he's hoping that they got the message of the things that they have learned from him. You are away from the church now. You're away from me as your pastor physically. But I believe that we've given you enough and you heard enough preaching and you heard enough from this Bible, read enough to know how to walk. But yet, Paul and I are saying, I'm telling you this again with tears. Watch those because everybody's not walking the walk. Let me go on. With tears, he said, many, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Or in King James, he says, many walk. He says, they tread about as enemies of the cross of Christ. They're against what we're preaching. Voices are rampant now. The internet is filled with everybody online. They're Zoom or Zooming your minds away. Everybody's got a voice, but you got to make sure you have to follow someone that has a witness and a testimony. Now, this is Paul speaking. I hold my life before you, not as being perfect, but I know the perfect one. 
but I want you to know that I am endeavoring to follow this book and live out my life to please God. Yes, there's none perfect but Jesus Christ, but my life and my desire is to live this thing out. Paul is saying at one point he was the chief of sinners, but yet he worked harder than all of them to prove that he wanted to be faithful to the Lord. So many are walking. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Keep that in mind. The, the peace, the God of peace is going to get near the cross of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 24 to 24, 24 through I think 25, is Paul is talking about this cross. He says to the Jews, it's a stumbling block or it's an offense. It's scandalous. It doesn't make any sense. There's too many mystical stories behind it. Unto the Greeks, he said, it's foolishness or silliness or it's as absurdity or ridiculous. It said it doesn't make it's not in, it doesn't make any sense. It's inconsistent to think about the cross of Christ. The reason has no logic to it. A cross, a man dies, and this man should have been victorious, but it seemed like it was ridiculous for him to die. But we know his dying gave us life. His dying gave us gave us peace, and that peace is the peace of God. But it also his dying appeased God because blood had to be sacrificed for life to be lived again. He goes on in the same context of Corinthians. Paul said, but this cross unto them which are called both Jews and Greek. Keep in mind, he's talking to Philippi and there was Jews and Greeks. There, were, there, there was a mixture in that area. He said, but there he talks to them and to us and said, this Jews and Greeks in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and 24, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God knows everything he's doing. Even now, let me just digress for a moment. What we're going through and what we're dealing with right now, it doesn't make sense to us. But God has a plan in all this church. He's wiser than any man and even wiser than us. I think one writer says our thoughts are not his thoughts and his ways are not our ways. He goes on to talk about this Christ, this, this cross, and he wants us to see how powerful it is. But Paul wants us to understand that he is the model set before them in Philippians 3. As the model, he's not being egotistic, but he's saying to them in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, you follow me as I follow Christ. If I stop following Christ, in other words, you stop following me. You only follow someone that's following Christ. That means that they are following the light and the example that Christ has set forth. Paul said, this is my example. Christ is my example. The example of Christ was he was working, he was laboring, he was serving, he was ruling in the spirit of Christ, the spirit of love. That was Paul's life. He knew that he had to put the work in and work as unto the Lord. Therefore, earning himself, Paul, the right to say to people of all ages, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. If you want to reflect the imitation of anybody, imitate me as I have imitated Christ. Things that are practiced that brings about this joy in our lives is the things we have learned. Let's go over it again. It is the Christian practice of things, the things you have learned. It is this Christian practice of things that you have both learned and you are also learned them by the experience and by the doctrine that Paul is preaching, that we are preaching, the gospel. He said it is the advancement of doing good. What you have learned, now you put into practice. Things you have received. The Christian blessings that we have received things, we've taken them up. He says with, without anything, that taking them up and not just taking them up, but we've also put them in our head and in our hearts. A person can learn things, but they have never really put it into their soul, into their heart, where that becomes a part of them. Book knowledge, head knowledge, but no heart knowledge. Paul said if you learn these things and receive these things, he said not only in your head, but in your heart. Embrace them. Let them become a part of your everyday life. He said, with great affection and love, you received this word, the engrafted word, with the spirit of meekness, and you have it now in your heart. Once things get into your heart, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You don't walk around speaking doom and gloom and sad and mad and disgusted. You speak life. You speak hope. You speak peace. You speak the things that are true, lovely, you know, there it is, and a good report. You don't speak of negative things, and you don't allow negative things to get into your spirit. Things he says in this text, you have heard. 
hearing of him publicly, also privately, things you've heard from the pulpit in the conversation, you've heard from the voice, the abstract things you've heard in presence with Paul or with him absent. He's there, you heard him, and now he's absent, and, you do, and you're supposed to hear the same thing. Teaching of the gospel, and his message was the gospel and the cross of Jesus Christ. Philippians 3 now, and 10, he says that I may know him. Here's Paul now. Everything in life that he had learned, he gives his pedigree in this third chapter. He said, but out of all this, I count it dung or loss that I may win Christ, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. I want to be like him. I want to identify myself with him and know the power of his resurrection. If nothing else I know, I want to know him. One Greek word, I think it's called gnosko. It means I want to know him not just by a head knowledge, but I want to know him by a heart knowledge. Intimacy of knowing him. That means spending time with the person. Last one in our text, he says, and seen. The things you've seen, Paul says, that you know by my life, my conversation, everything you've seen me do as a pattern, as, as a believer. He said, I want you to do those things, practice those things. He says, live those things out as an exemplification of God and the peace of the God of peace, I'm sorry, shall be with you. Living these things out and you'll have Christ right in your life. In verse 8 of Philippians uh, 4, he goes again, he says, he says, we do not just meditate on these things, things which are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, out of good report. But in verse 9 of Philippians 4, he says, but we do these things. We carry these things out. You see, the Christian life is very practical, I might say. It's, it's an experience. It's real. It's, it's a situation. It's also an action. It's situation in situations and actions is one that is carried out. It, it is, is rather an ideal imagery, an imitation of something that's real. It's a pattern. It's a things that are true. It's not just a myth but it's something that is genuine. It is not a dead, dry, and, and, and formal human religious life and rituals. We don't go with, with no outward show, with the outward form of show. No, it's a life with divine power living inside of us. It's vital, it's dynamic, it's liberating. It's not religious, but it's also a relationship. Religious because we understand the point of belief and we understand the outward form of worship. We worship the true and the living God. Here is what Paul wants us to grab on to. This is not a religion without power. He said, this thing you live out and there's power within it. He says, not only does it have power, it has also an assignment to that power. One writer said, I think it's Isaiah, the power was come, coming to set the captive free. I'm on assignment. Say that with me tonight. I'm on assignment in this pandemic. I come to set the captive free, to deliver those from sin, sickness, and poverty, and the position and positioning them into a relationship with God. A little side story in the book of Mark about the power of God. There was a man in the ninth chapter in the 23rd verse, and this man's son had a demon, a spirit demon. The demon was one that had monalities, monalities, moralities, moralities to it. The speechlessness and causing the man physical deafness and forming, forming at the mouth. A man, son was throwing fits, I'm sorry, gushing on his teeth and pining away, lifeless and complete exhaustion. Suicidal tendencies was on the man that we didn't know what the son was going to do, often throwing him into the fire. And the Bible says the disciples came and they couldn't do anything because they did not have the faith to move. But Jesus said to the man, bring your son to me. The powerlessness of the man that could not help his son, the father that was weak and could not help his son, but he brought his son to Jesus. The story is just to show you of the church and what the real power that's in the church. Not just religious go about people, but there is deliverance in the house of God. When they brought the man to Jesus, the man was at his end because he had already ran into the disciple, the so-called church people. And the man said to Jesus, if you can do anything, he said, take my son and heal him. Jesus says, no, in verse 23 of Mark 9, he says, no. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. It's that faith that's in the believer that gets to all things God to do the all things that are impossible in your life. That's the power Paul is saying that's in the church. 
Paul's life here now and continues to be a model for us. It's a pattern, an example. He teaches us how to what, what we have learned, what we receive, what we've heard, what we have seen. He said, I am the character. I am the conversation and the conduct. You can follow my example because my life is a testimony of the things that you've learned from me, you received from me, you heard of me, and you've seen of me. You can go back and find Big Mama then. You always hear me talk about Big Mama. And I, I was able at nine years old to be with my, my grandmother and was able to go by her house and help clean up and do things. And after a stroke in her body, I would always see around, walk around the house singing. Uh, you're probably too old to remember the Mahalia Jackson, but she would sing these songs, you know, and, and talk about how great God is. And how I got over, and I'm looking at this woman, and she's she's stricken in her body, but wasn't stricken in her mind. But she still was confident that even though I got this ailment, I got this infirmity in my body, God is still on the throne. And God kept her into later years in life, and she never lost her faith in God. I learned from watching her that if she would do this and stay faithful to God, even in the midst of hard times, then what's my excuse? What's my reason to not keep praising God? And and thanking him with full activity of my limbs, that's somebody you can learn something from. Paul lets us see his testimony of the things that he went through and the things regarding his suffering. In 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and I'm going to paraphrase down to verse 23 to verse 30. Read it. It's a good context to look at again. Look at the suffering of Paul. His life was not one that was easy, but he's going to get us to this God of peace. I ain't forgotten my subject. I'm going to get you there. He says in this 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 23 down to 30, he talks about himself being beaten with rods and how he was beaten with many stripes and with rods. He was stoned. He was left for dead after he was stoned, shipwrecked, and in journeys, pearls or dangers of waters and robbers and perils of countrymen, hated Hated and all he hated and put in the wilderness, false brotherings and weakness and painfulness, watchings and hunger, thirst and fasting, often in the cold and nakedness. He said, and all these things, he said, that are without, there was also the things that were within the care of all the churches, the daily responsibilities of the churches. Paul was not one that was weak. He says in this text, he says, and oh, I'm not weak. Tell yourself, I'm not weak. What you've gone through tells me you're not weak. No one could have survived what you have survived and gone through what you've gone through. So you're not weak at all. The enemy wants to make you think you're weak in the sense that you're helpless and enabling to do what God has given you to do. I'm weak of my own ability, but I'm strong in Christ. Paul said, I'm not weak, neither am I offended. I'm not stumbling over this or tripping about what I'm going through. If God says this is what I got to deal with, I didn't sign up for it, that his grace is sufficient to get me and you through it. Outwardly, he says here, I'm going through all these things, but the peace of God is setting inside of me. It amazes me how a single parent mom can pick up from where she was dropped at and say, I got to go on with these children and raise these babies. Or a single parent man can pick up and say, I got to go on jobless and knowing I got to find a way to get through this. But even as you move, you don't look like what you've been through. You walk with a confidence that there's peace in my life. Yeah, I've been left for dead. Yeah, I've been walked out on. Yes, people have turned their back on me. Family don't even want to talk to me. But every time they call me, why are you so peaceful? Because I've got something the world didn't give me and I got the peace of God living inside my life. It is an indication of the infirmities that you go through that even in the midst of these infirmities, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. The peace of God, peace of God, it flows. The peace of God, watch it now in Philippians 4 and look around verse 8 or 9, at verse 7 or 8, verse 7, he talks about the peace of God. And now in verse, verse 9, he talks about the God of peace. And the peace of God flows from the God of peace. He's the one that sends the peace to you. The peace, when you're in a storm, he sends it to you. Look at the peace, though, that he's given us. He sends this peace through Christ Jesus himself. Romans 5 and 1 says that it comes through Christ Jesus. As it comes through him, it's the peace that appeases the, the, the demands of heaven, and Jesus Christ brings this peace. Galatians, or Colossians 1 19 and 20, and, and I may be moving fast in the scripture, but you can go back and listen to this again. I got a lot to tell you in a few little, little bit of time, but I don't want to lose you because you got to watch Netflix. So listen, so 
Colossians 1, he goes on and say in verse 19 and 20, he said, For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus Christ, all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things in earth or things in heaven, having made peace, watch it, through the blood of the cross. Here's now the picture that Paul is talking about when he ends this dissertation of the peace of God. And that peace comes through the blood of the cross. This peace that is passing all our understanding. It is a, it goes beyond our comprehension, our clever thoughts, our ingenuous thoughts, our ingenuous thinking. It, it goes beyond the plans and comprehension of man. That peace is transcending every thought and surpassing all my dreams beyond my wildest imagination. I can't understand how, why is why shouldn't I not be frattled, unraveled, unraveled and falling apart because I have the peace of God. This peace that goes beyond my understanding will is a mind blowing peace. It just blows your mind. The peace of God, which passing all understanding, which peace that cannot be disturbed. In him, you cannot be disturbed. When you know that inside of you, without a doubt, Christ lives and resides, you cannot be anxious or inax about these things. Settle yourself down and rest in the peace of God. The greatest characteristics of this, this highest blessing is the peace of God. It's peace of God, he says, not only moves me into a gladness that I think on these things, but I walk these things out. There is peace in his love. There is peace in his holiness. There is peace in his comforting. There is a whole matter of peace in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mankind was so miserable and rebelled against God. God had to send his son into the world to bring about peace to mankind. Here man now needing this peace, so Jesus comes to make up the difference and dies on the cross, and he becomes our peace. He destroys the enemy that was trying to take us totally away from God, and he reconciles us back to God. See it in Colossians 2, 1, I think through 5, over there, it says, he says, blotted out the uh, wiped out the, uh, maybe Colossians one and fifteen. It's in there. He said he blotted out the handwritings of ordinance, ordinance or laws that was against us. He said which was contrary to us, and taking it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. Are you following me? That Paul is saying the peace of God came by the cross. It wasn't something that I worked for or I earned, but it came by the cross. Having spoiled this principalities and powers and making a show of them openly triumphing over them in it or in the cross. He said this peace, this peace blotted out the handwritings of audience, ordinance, the law, nailing it to the cross. I want you to see this spoiled or ruined principalities and powers. If this happened on the cross way over 2,000 years ago, then what you tripping about right now? Jesus hung it all up on the cross and rendered it powerless. Ah, oh, God. He took the sting out of it, took the bite out of the enemy and said he's powerless. You heard it like this. There is no weapon formed against you that's going to prosper. Anything the enemy formed is only going to make you better and not worse. Therefore, we can boldly say that we can have this peace. I can say that I have this peace and it's operating in my life right now. The peace within myself that I know the sin has been removed. The stress and strain is over. The struggle is gone. I find myself in a strange place of peace. When the enemy wants to tell me, you know you're wrong and God's going to kill you. He killed Jesus on the cross. So you got to live. Now he will correct you and bring you and me back in line. But God's not out trying to kill you. You got to get that out your mind. He wants you to come in line and live out all that he's given you and me to have this peace on the inside. There's a strange peace that sets on me and you. It makes me live out this peace. This peace that transcends my understanding, gives me peace with myself, and also my, gives me peace with others. Note, you jump past it, Clinton, in the fourth chapter in verse 2. Here was two women, Yodius and Sintai. They were arguing over whatever they were arguing about, and Paul says, I would that you be of the same mind. Settle your differences, and don't let your peace be disturbed. Sometimes you can lose your peace arguing about stuff that don't make no sense at all. 
He told these women, be of the same mind. Come to an agreement. It needs to be an agreement within the church. We don't need things to come back in to the church when we get back together and it disturbs our peace. We need that same peace that's in your home to be in the church, embracing this state of peace. Regardless of the circumstances that's going on around us, conditions may not change, but my peace will remain the same. And my peace is settled in the peace of God. This peace the Bible talks about that Enoch had when he walked with God. In Genesis 5 and 24, he walked with God and God walked with him. The Bible speaks over there about his walk with God and God was pleased with him. He was walking Enoch at a time of Genesis 4 and 23 when Lemiash went to wanted to impress his wives, went about wandering about, he says, and killed a man and came back and was glad about it. Murder was raising rampant and people were going crazy. Sounds like our world we're living in right now. People don't care who they hurt or what they're doing, but God is sending peace because the church is still down here. Oh, the enemy may go a little bit, but he ain't going all the way. Only the church can let or hinder him in this hour that we live in. He says, Lemuel here, and Enoch was walking with God, and the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 5, hang with me, I'm almost there. He says, he said, by faith, Enoch walked with God. And as Enoch was translated, that he should not see death. For it, for, and he was not found because God had translated him or took him. He said, for before he was translated, he had this testimony that he pleased God. It was a bad condition, but, but Enoch had a testimony like Paul that he pleased God. I, I want to have this testimony that out of all that you hear, say, or heard, or, or, or think about me or you, let's let it be said, I please God. God came and got Enoch and took him out the earth. Also came and got Elijah with a whirlwind and took him up out the earth. These men were walking in such perfectness that God said, it's too good, it's too bad down here for you to keep walking in this. I need you later on. And when the time comes in Revelation, when the millennial age come, Enoch and here also Elijah is going to come back. And they're going to be the witnesses to tell the unregenerated world that you got to come back to Jesus Christ. A witness is always left. Now, we ain't ready to be raptured just yet. We got some work to do right down here. But God left the church down here to be a witness in the earth with the testimony that we please. God, that we please God with our whole life, with our whole attitude, with our whole walk. We see the promise here in pleasing God that we have peace with God, Paul is saying. When you walk as God wants you to walk and you walk in what God wants you to do, you have this testimony that God will be walking with you. The peace of God will be with you. It is written that you believe in this, so now do these things. Before I close, let me say that no matter whatever difficult circumstance may arise, you can quench it by peace. Isn't that a blessing tonight? I took you a long way around to bring you to this. And you can walk in and look at tragedy and up, things that are upsetting you and speak to that stuff and say, the God of peace is with me. And I decree and declare peace in my mind, peace in my children's life, peace over my home, peace over the things that are worrying me. I decree and declare peace in my home, in the name of Jesus. You can quince it because you have the God of peace. Whatever is happening, God will be with you. He will walk with you. He will walk through this thing with you. Remember these things, he says to us. Learn them. You receive them. You heard of them. You sing them. Now do them. Practice these things and watch this God of peace be with you. If your home is upset in your relationship, just go and declare peace in your marriage, peace in your body, peace in your spirit in the name of Jesus. And the God of peace, this is not just anybody, this is the God that can infuse peace into your life. It's an individual that becomes, it becomes a lifestyle. Peace becomes a lifestyle with you. And God's peace shall be with you. This life of peace, he says, no matter where you're at, whether in life or in death, this peace will be with you. Paul, remember, is on death row. He is not knowing if he's going to get out of this all right. But he's at a conclusion in his mind that the God of peace is with me. I'm persuaded that he is still on my side. I know I'm locked in here and it don't seem like it's a good testimony, but I can tell you I'm all right inside of here. I'm in a good place because I know 
in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What a blessing testimony that a man can sit looking to leave this earth and understand that it's a better place for me to go than to be down here. And I still got peace. That's powerful, church, to understand that it's not all easy, but I got peace. Nothing makes the devil more upset for you to just sit there calm, cool, and collected and say that it ain't bothering me. That I know that God is in control. It's going to turn out for my good. That's a peace beyond my mind-blowing understanding. Paul concludes with us in Hebrews, this 13th chapter in verse 5. And he says, and in these words, it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Here's the promise of God. I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. I will settle in down in your spirit even though you're in a tough place right now. I promise I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Let me say it like this. Help me out, Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, it shall not overflow you. When you walk through fire, it shall not burn you. Neither shall the flames scorch or be kindled upon you. Isaiah 42, 43, 2 and 3. You're going to pass through something, but God says, I got you. The message Bible brings it a little brighter. He says, when you're in over your head, or you've been there, I'll be there with you. When you're in a rock, and when you're in rough waters, you will not go down. You will not go down. And when you're between a rock and a hard place, I won't be, I will be, it won't be, it won't be a dead end. Well, no matter where you're at, God says, I got you. No matter what got you in the corner, you got peace with me. Paul closes this doxology in that same 13th chapter. And he says in verse 20 through 21, he says, in, I'm paraphrasing the conclusion of the text. He says, listen, there's two significance here in this 13th chapter, verse 20 through 21. He said, Christ's death and resurrection is here. He says, now God is working something in us. And that working in us is through a mighty power. It's something that's pulling the church back up. It's something that's pulling us into the fourth front of the line. More prayer, more power. Little prayer, little power. But God is bringing the church back to the place of resting. I hear the words moving through the land. It's going to be over in a moment. It's going to be all right in the morning. And God's turning the thing around for our good. He's up to something and I'm a part of the plan. He's called is saying in this Hebrews 13 chapter, listen, people, places and things, God is working something. He is changing something on the inside of us. He's doing something that he can only do through adversity. It's the best teacher of our lives. I don't know what you're made of till you go through something. But when you come through it, you'll know that I came out like pure gold. But in this adversity, he says in Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21, he says, now may the God of peace, you see it again? This same God resides still in Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up the Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd and the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you that his and is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He is the God of peace. May he be with you. May he reside in you. May he reside around you. May he give you confidence that oh you walk through the valley of the shadow of death he will be with you he will never leave you nor forsake you he is the God of peace rest in that rest in that rest in that word believe that word embrace it settle it in your heart that I have live it inside of me the God of peace who brought Jesus Christ back from the dead he is residing and living in me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this word tonight. We thank you for where it has been sent to and those that are receiving it tonight. I pray, God, that it's settled in their spirits. No matter what, how doom and gloom things look, you are the God of peace. We receive these things. We've heard these things. We've learned these things. And we've seen these things. And we're walking these things out. And you're walking with us. We thank you for your residence in our lives, in our homes, and in our minds. I speak peace in my mind. Speak peace in my soul. Peace in my spirit. The God of peace reign, rules, and abide in my home. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.